Good evening, everyone. My name is Sybil Sheridan. I'm the director of the Lions Learning Project. And it's with great pleasure that I welcome you all here tonight for this joint Lions Learning Project Jewish Renaissance event. The Lions family provided a legacy to promote the study of Jewish history and culture. And it's exactly a year and two days, some of you will remember, since the Lions Learning Project relaunched with Simon Sharma giving a truly memorable talk. During the past year, we found ourselves increasingly working with Jewish Renaissance, whose series of talks demonstrate a very similar aim to ours. And so it is to our delight that since September, we've been officially working together to provide talks like the talks that we're going to have tonight and standalone events as well as series to show off ourselves to the world and demonstrate the immense richness and diversity that can be found in Jewish life today. Of course, our one year is nothing to the 20 years that Jewish Renaissance have been in existence. And that truly is a cause of celebration. And I know that this is the first of many exciting events that are planned for the coming year by Jewish Renaissance. But as for tonight, we welcome St. Nicholas Heitner and Katie Lipson to, count, to talk with us. And they will be in conversation for about 40 minutes, after which there will be a chance to ask questions. You've all been muted now, and if you have a question, we ask that you uh, write it in the chat. Um, and then if there is time and you can ask your question, you will be unmuted and you'll be able to ask it. But to begin the proceedings, I will hand you over to Judy Herman, the arts director and theatre critic for Jewish Renaissance, who will chair this evening's event. Thank you so much, Sybil. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by saying it's my enormous joy and pleasure to introduce these two inspiring individuals who share so much. They have a passion for theatre and the ability and application, energy and nous to make theatre happen so that we all get to share the results. They also share a Manchester Jewish childhood. And I was going to start by saying Katie was educated at Manchester High School for Girls, but we've just also learned she went to King David Primary School. And she did her BA in music at Goldsmiths. Nick went to Manchester Grammar School and read English at Cambridge. Music and the love of music, and especially musicals, have played a big part in the professional lives of both our guests. As well as producing and directing musicals, Kate is a gifted musician. She plays piano, cello and guitar, and she writes songs too. Wow. And she also set up the From Page to Stage Festival to support new musicals. And she has all different stages of development, and she's now given a platform to over a hundred new musicals, many of which have gone on to have full production. Nick has famously directed both operas and musicals, as well as plays. Both have produced and directed and run theatres. Nick famously the National Theatre for 12 years from 2003 to 2015, where he was responsible for as many as 20 shows a year and the introduction of the £10 ticket season sponsored by Travelex in 2003, which is credited alongside imaginative programming with helping to attract a younger, more diverse audience. And then in 2017, with his friend and colleague, former NT Executive Director Nick Starr, he opened London's Bridge Theatre, a wonderful, flexible space seating around 900. Award-winning Katie founded her production company, Aria Entertainment, in 2012, and the clue's in the name. She has specialised in producing a range of musicals, both at Manchester's Hope Mill Theatre and in London Theatre, including the Arts Theatre and Southwark Playhouse, and vitally on tour around the UK. From 2016 to 19, she was producing artistic director for Hope Mill's 13 in-house musicals. Shows include the 50th anniversary production of Hair, 
marvellous, I saw that one, and several with Jewish creatives and or story, like Alfred Urey's Parade, I think that was the outside London premiere of that one, Stephen Schwartz's Pippin, Rags, fantastic, following Jewish immigrants to turn of the century America, and Maine by the late, great Jerry Herman. An early high-profile Jewish theme production of Nick Heitner's was Joshua Sobol's Ghetto at the National Theatre in 1989. He directed the 1996 film of Arthur Miller's The Crucible, and in 2012, the NT production of Nicholas Wright's Travelling Light, a wonderfully beguiling alternative account of the birth of moving pictures that begins in the shtetls of the old country. It starred the magnificent and sadly missed Anthony Sher, and, like so many of Cage's productions, toured extensively. So welcome, as I said, and may I ask you both, Katie first, I think, um, this is our 20th anniversary year. Um, I, I know you're, you're young, yeah, very young yet, Katie, to have done so much, but what might your connection have been to theatre 20 years ago, and how has it changed? Well, <laughs> I mean, ever since I was very young, I was constantly taken to theatre, both at the Palace and the Opera House and the Royal Exchange, and I was heavily involved with both performing in school plays and the Jewish Theatre Group in North Manchester, where oh. we did some brilliant shows like The Pirates of Penzance and Annie and Joseph, um, and I was, I was always um, a huge fan of musical theatre and from a very early age knew that it was a huge part of my life, as was music. Um, and obviously it took me a little bit longer to discover what my role would be as an adult and when, for a career. But in those early years, I was very much uh, on stage, singing, musically directing, playing the piano, getting involved with classical music and taking every opportunity around me to immerse myself in shows. I mean, we did Fiddler on the Roof at Manchester Grammar and Assassins and West Side Story. And in those days I was, you know, performing in some of the leading roles in these shows, but very quickly realized that I wanted to be behind the scenes and I wanted to be a creative. Um, but that's what I was doing around the age of 15. And I did music GCSE and A-level and drama A-level. Um, and I knew that, it was, you know, it was, it was who I was. Um, it was part of me, um, and I knew it would be part of my future. I'm slightly worried that we might have lost an astonishing performer. <laughs> no, well, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe my life could have been different had I chosen that path. But you know, when you know the role, and when I realised what a producer was. That was the light bulb. That was the moment. I think I probably said to you in previous interviews, I was like, that's the perfect role for me, the business and the art, bring it together. And I can be the overarching creative that puts other brilliant people in a room and hopefully channel something brilliant on stage. That's really, what a wonderful answer. And, what, what, and Nick, what were you doing 20 years ago? I know exactly where I was. I was in New York. Uh -huh. uh, I had just been appointed director of the National Theatre, so I was thinking very, very hard about what I thought the National Theatre should be and what the theatre in general should be. But uh, I was about to, I was, I was in rehearsal for a Broadway show written by Marvin Hamlish, who is uh, uh, music by Marvin Hamlish and book by John Guare, Sweet Smell of Success, based on, um, based on the movie, the classic, cynical, dark movie from the 50s. Um, total flop. Uh, although I, I still look back on it and think it was wonderful. The music was absolutely, I, I think, God, how, do, how wrong did I get it? Was that what was wrong? Or was it that it was too dark, too cynical for the times? But I was working with Marvin Hamlish, one of the many amazing people I've worked with over now what's quite a long career. Um, and I was at the same time, so I was deeply um, involved up to my elbows in Broadway. Um, by the way, had one of the last people to have kind of a, a, a mythical Broadway experience where it's all, you've had the opening night, everybody's thrilled, everybody's on a high. You go to the party at the Waldorf Astoria, Everybody's really, really thrilled. They think it's a tremendous success. 
and you're having a good time with all the people that you've been working with the last few months and you look around and suddenly the room's empty because they've found the because somebody's delivered the new york times oh. um, and that is that famously happened i'd always heard that happen and there it was it was literally one moment you were having a great time the next moment the only people who are there are the cast and the people who made the show that doesn't happen katie will that will never happen to you because now they've looked at the new york times review on their phones and if the new york times review stinks they don't even come to the party so uh so the the party that empties out all of a sudden has passed into history more seriously though um it was when i was thinking very hard about what i wanted the national theater to be um so that, that's where i was Right. So do you want to elaborate on what you wanted the National Theatre to be at that point then? Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I think that's a question that needs to get asked every 10, 15 years or so. And the answer always has to be different. There's never um, there's never an answer that lasts um, quite usefully. The National has no written historic mission statement. Um, when it was founded, founded decades after it was first proposed, um, it, um, it was such a scramble to get it over the starting line that uh, a constitution or a statement of intent um, was simply uh, not part of uh, the um, not 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 part of the uh, foundations on which it on which it stands uh there was um there was a kind of statement of intent back in the early 1900s written by the critic william archer elaborated on by harley granville barker um and basically it was plays of the past plays of the recent past and new plays but that's that still seems to be what you got to do yeah. But I thought the way to look at it at the time was to look at the two constituent parts of its name, the national and the theatre. What does being national mean and what does theatre mean? And both those questions obviously have a different answer uh, every time you ask them, every five years, every 10 years. Very, very different to run a national theatre in 2003, which is when I actually started, but April 2003, I had a year to think about it and 1963 when it opened at the Old Vic under Laurence Olivier. Um, so, uh, and, and very, very different again when uh, I left and um, Rufus Norris had to ask, ask those questions again. Um, the priorities of the theatre, the priorities of the nation, what the nation feels like, um, are always changing. Um, I wanted to I want it as everybody who comes in needs to shake it up and 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 take a new road, um, respond to new talent, to respond to the kind of people who haven't yet appeared at the National Theatre. It's exactly the same thing as happened in 2015 when I left. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that there was a, a new and vibrant connection between the classical repertoire and an ever expanding audience and a new repertoire and an ever expanding audience. And so it was around about the time that I was thinking about, I was thinking with my colleague Nick Starr about how do we, how do we make the tickets much cheaper? How do we fill all the empty seats? Uh, there's a lot of seats to, to fill at the National Theatre. How do we make the repertoire feel like it, um, feel like it has something to say? to uh, an audience that maybe would come if it knew about it, maybe had given up coming because it had got too expensive, it had got too expensive because it had been so starved of subsidy and had the great good luck to come in at a time, uh, come in at a time when the purse strings were being loosened. I had the great good luck to come in at a time when, um, when Gordon Brown was chancellor, Tessa Jowell was uh, Secretary of State for Culture and the whole, the, the whole tone of government and the whole relationship of government towards arts and education was supportive of everything we were trying to do. Um, so that was good. Yeah. So Katie, when you first came into the theatre as a producer, what, what, so what, what were you thinking 
about? I mean, could you see your way to where you wanted to go? Or were you sucking it and seeing or, or what? I knew straight away that I wanted independence, which is both a brilliant thing to have because you have a lot of creative control. I can choose the shows, the creatives, but it's a very lonely uh, job to be a solo producer doing it at the very beginning when you're raising your first £5,000, you're literally raising from the very first pound to, you know, nowadays we're raising, you know, I'm raising bigger sums of money, but you had to start somewhere. So I was always artist driven. So I was always driven to do the revival I wanted to do in a new way and to work with interesting performers and creatives. So I wasn't chasing the commercial um sort of uh opportunities at first I was very much like I'll start small and I'll build my name and my name will attract bigger investors and I will then go to America and knock on doors and try and get better titles and honestly 10 years of that uh, to, it's got me sort of here um and it, it has been hard work but it's all been worth it I mean I've done 70 shows of which probably I would say 60 of those shows were I mean, in, in Nick's world, more like non-for-profits, as in those shows never made any money. I needed some subsidy somewhere, either myself or an investor or the Arts Council. And these were sort of six-week runs at the Southwark Playhouse, the other palace, even in the early days, the Landor, the Union. And mm. the Hope Mill was a real stretch. You know, we never made any money, could even pay ourselves. It was all a labour of love. But I did know, and as I got more experienced, I saw the path. I was starting to attract investors. I was attracting high profile writers who were interested in this lower budget, but creative world to reimagine some of their bigger shows, which didn't work when they had more money spent on them. Kind of something that the Many A Chocolate Factory have done very well. Um, and obviously they built, as did the Don Mar. And I just started to think about how I would be able to make a sustainable business model which was then I, when I sort of started looking at commercial touring and understanding how I would balance both the shows that made me money and kept me operational and the shows which might be done for a different reason, either to build a relationship or to try something out smaller, lower budget before we could see if it had a life. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I didn't have the big plan. I just went into it and like an artist that isn't um, the writer, I followed my heart and I produced the shows that spoke to me um, and threw everything at them um, and luckily managed to stay afloat in those first years where, you know, I was still working elsewhere. You know, I, I was a singing teacher at the Brit School for five years, teaching repertoire to young aspiring performers that went to Mount View. And because I was such a geek, honestly, a geek of musical theatre, I had a repertoire knowledge really big. And one of my main focus was to help people auditioning for Arts Ed and Mount View and RADA or whatever to, you know, to sing a certain song that would help them be noticed in the audition. And that was how I really survived through my, really, until I was about 30 almost, you know, I wasn't really earning enough money as a producer. I was I was doing all that. So, yeah, it's 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 hard. And I think I do think people that are younger producers now wouldn't necessarily be able to do that anymore, because I think a lot of us young producers have done a lot of those titles. We've done these revivals that should have a small off Western run. And now it's harder to find the repertoire to make a name for yourself. Of course, there'll be a cycle of doing Pippin again and doing hair again and you know, uh, parade, but ultimately the, there was the Hope Mill and there was the Southwark Playhouse and these venues really helped elevate the start of my company, really. I think, um, I was just going to say, it's, it's the being outside London, it's being in Manchester that's very special, I think. It's really important that, the, isn't, isn't it, Nick, maybe you want to talk about it between you, that, you know, that it is, we're not, we're too, sometimes we're too London based and it's yeah. marvellous. It I'm, was. And the touring is terribly important to both of you, I know. So whether you've got some notes you want to exchange on that one, I don't know. But well, just to stay on the Hope Mill front, you know, that was that was fate that I met the two boys that sort of, you know, got the building and they wanted to have a producing partner. And I was sort of quite knowledgeable of titles. And I said, we need to put titles in here that are brave, exciting and wouldn't be seen at the Exchange or the Palace or the Opera House. Now, with that gave great um, audience sort of, 
reaction, um, you know, when they saw Parade, when they saw Hair, when we did this original piece called Yank, which was an original musical from America that had never been seen, that got a great response from the audience. But it was tricky to see the next steps for those pieces because we were programming harder, um, you know, less commercial work, but we were able to gain traction through the response the audiences gave. But it was a great joy to bring Parade and do these shows in Manchester mm -hmm. in a fringe theatre that they'd never really experienced the audiences. The idea of a show that close to them with wow. the act, 16 actors singing their hearts out. Mm -hmm. um, and some of my most rewarding days as a producer were, were, were there. And also my family could see my work. <laughs> that, that, couldn't come to, that was all for them, really. I'm dying to meet those two boys. I was about to meet them, I think, before Christmas when, when COVID happened again. Are you, do you speak to them a lot, Katie? Yeah, of course. Will you tell them to get back in touch? Because I'm dying to meet them. I, I admire what they're doing so much. Uh, I, think I, had a coffee, I had a coffee day with them. In, they were in London and then they couldn't come. So um, I, th I think there's amazing stuff, obviously, going on there. And, um, and oh, amazing stuff going on outside London. Um, th there's so many of the regional theatres now have phenomenally um, uh, inventive and creative and committed artistic directors. Um, it's um, uh, uh, um, theatres like Chichester and Sheffield, Nottingham, um, uh, Bristol, they're all, uh, Liverpool are brilliantly run and brilliant, brilliant stuff going on. And I know the exchange is under new direction now. Um, um, and um, I think I've met Roy, I haven't met, is it Bryony? Yeah. yeah, I but but well, when I was a, when I was growing up in Manchester, the, the exchange had yet to happen. It was um, it was still at sixty nine theatre at the um, at the university theatre uh, or the library theatre. But seeing stuff at the Opera House and the Palace, um, you know, seeing the RSC on tour at the Palace um, was was tremendously influential on, on uh, for me and seeing opera on tour. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, I think as a, when I was a sixth former, I had two friends and we all discovered, for, of all things, Wagner together by going oh. to the oh. ring, the ring, Wagner's ring, which came, which came kind of year by year oh. to the, the, uh, Saddler's World as it then was, um, with, um, I, I can even remember the cast, I'm not kind of a, of a geek. So yeah, it's, uh. It, the the, the um, and really hard for them over the last couple of years, and I admire for, I, I admire so much what people like Adam Penford and Rob Hasty and Daniel Evans have been doing uh, to to keep stuff going, real quality stuff going. Bu building on that, can both of you possibly manage to name a piece of theatre or perhaps a mentor who's most influenced? your perspective on theatre making? Katie? Well, look, I was a kid of the 90s, really, and that was kind of an exciting time for musical theatre. I mean, you know, so that that was the peak of the Disney animation. You know, that was mm. when we had The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and gosh, you, you know, to have that introduction when you're a young oh. kid and to see the quality of that writing and to just to get immersed in it. I think my mum took me to see Beauty and the Beast at the Dominion and it was one of the most joyous experiences of my life. And of course, you know, Miss Saigon, Les Mis, these epic song through <laughs> pop, yeah, pop um, operas. I mean, Miss Saigon especially I love because I like the story. I really, I really love the story of the mother and her sacrifice. You know, I really can connect with that and found it incredibly moving but you're hearing the most glorious soundtracks you know so, so at that age I wasn't quite aware of the new musical scene in terms of you know the things that didn't make it to Broadway or the West End I always heard about those Tony award-winning West End Broadway hits and there were so many of high quality pieces um, and then as I got older obviously discovering the off-Broadway and the more you know avant-garde sometimes shows that are at the public theatre and the Lincoln Centre and realised just how diverse the genre was and the voice and just how innovative musical theatre can be. Um, so it's not necessarily an individual, it was just 
I was just completely transfixed with musicals as a young person. Musicals were everything. I didn't really pay as much attention to plays when I was younger. But when I got to around 16, 17, because the exchange actually didn't do musicals when I was doing my A-levels, it was a playhouse. I went to see every single play in the Royal Exchange and actually having that intimacy in the round, sitting on those banquettes for £10, I think, because if you were a student, if you were a student under 21, you could get a £10 ticket there, or even £5. I saw everything, every single play, and it was thrilling. So, yeah, um, I think it's the mega musicals of the 80s, 90s and the Disney, um, the quality of those shows that really taught me how much I wanted to be part of this industry. Yeah, and Miss Saigon, of course, you played an enormous part in that, Nick, probably in uh, influencing Katie there then, because you, you, you directed it. I did, yeah, I did. I, I, um, yeah, I didn't produce it. It was not yeah, generated by me. It was, yeah. I, was invited to, I was invited to direct it. And, um, and looking back on it, I just, I just had no idea really um what uh what kind of success it potentially was going to have i just had this enormous playground apparently no budget um i just threw at it all the tricks that uh, and all the stuff um that i knew and um went along for the ride um so uh but it was uh, it was uh, an exciting thing to do and um yeah, uh, it, and the extra, filled with extraordinary good fortune, like um, discovering Leia Salonga. Mm, um, mm. um, you know, I think she was 18. This mesmerizingly charismatic, mm. um, totally natural uh, young woman with a stunning voice, and the whole show blossomed around her. So yeah, that was um, that was quite something. I'm, I'm guessing when you opened in New York that the restaurant didn't empty then on that one. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. There was no restaurant because camera and Macintosh leaves nothing to chance, and there was an astonishing party. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, um, in um, in the basement of the, uh, in the, the there's, there was a kind of reception area at the bottom of the World Trade Center, so I guess no longer that. Um, but it was it was an amazing party. Yeah, I can imagine that. Now, can we move on and talk about? Uh, given that we're Jewish Renaissance, of course, I want to know: Do you see any relationship between your Jewish identity and your professional work? Is there a particular production that felt Jewish to you or where your identity might have impacted on your work or the choice of whether or not to actually take it on? Maybe there's a fair few, I hope so. So who would like to speak first? Speak to each other, please. You don't have to just speak to me. <laughs> Katie? There's I think me. obviously the, the, the work we choose to produce in many capacities is because we are, we connect with it or we identify with it and it speaks to us and we feel that it, the story has to be heard and there's two parts to my journey one is how jewish uh, jewish themed shows that i commissioned helped me pivot the company into being successful hmm. um i had an idea when i was teaching at the brit school one day and half my students didn't turn up which Sounds sad, but it's great when you're getting paid to just think and do other things. Um, I just thought about Jewish heritage and how the, the music of, of our incredible great American Jewish songwriters could be celebrated in, in musical form and cabaret form, dinner theatre. And I commissioned a series of shows to celebrate that, both starting with a show called The Jewish Legends, which was all about Groucho Marx and Zero Mustel and mm. um, Al Jolson. And then it went to the great Jewish American songbook where we went to Gershwin and Bernstein and Jerry Herb, you know, and then we did Jewish entertainment and we're doing Jewish Hollywood soon. Um, and I just worked out, you know, we're talking a small model still, we're still talking off West End, smaller budgets, but these shows always did well. And I saw my audiences there, my Jewish London audiences, literally um 
in their element and lapping up this Jewish culture and this Yiddish theatre sometimes that they were seeing. And it was incredibly moving to see particularly an older generation really feeling their roots when they when they heard some of this music and you know it I do these shows in North London theatres like the Gatehouse and the Radlett Centre and I take them to Hope Mill and I would do the Jewish Museum in Camden and sometimes wow. JW3 and sometimes Finchley Arts Depot every time my audiences wouldn't let me down and they allowed my company to kind of stay afloat in the early years because the profit those shows would make would subsidize a loss making show I would do elsewhere. Um, and like I say, I would learn so much about the history of the Jewish songwriter, or the Jewish performer through the last hundred years. And it was hugely inspiring to, you know, to think I am part of that and I'm continuing that. Um, and I'm and I'm allowing audiences to immerse themselves in history and some of the most beautiful memories they had and someone's singing my Yiddish mama and you're seeing people crying on the front oh. row feeling that nostalgia that they would have had you know as a young person listening to that song and then obviously later we did revivals of the bar mitzvah boy the jack rose mm. yes, black that. musical yeah. <laughs> you know and and obviously rags which was a troubled show on broadway from 1985 i think that I always knew the, 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 the CD, my friend Giles is on from Florida, he's on, he's watching now, and he oh. brought me the CD from Camden and said, look at this musical, Judy Coombe is in it, and we were big fans of her, because of Pocahontas um, and Les Mis, and I was obsessed with it, and then for years was chasing Stephen Schwartz to have permission to redo it, and after building a relationship with him through Pippin, we did it finally, but um Again, I think Rags was probably one of the most uh, emotional experiences mm. I've had as a producer. You know, look, looking at the subject matter and the plight of the immigrant and what this, you know, the first immigrants in it from, through Ellis Island to New York went through and, and then and what new people go through. So it was, you know, it is important. And I continue to think about shows that can sort of promote my culture and I have ideas in mind as I'm developing of things I'd like to commission and artists I'd like to work with because because the more successful you become there are op more opportunities you do have the freedom to choose and to approach people and to maybe have some funding to do something that you might not get to do earlier on in your career um, so I'm looking forward to those journeys over the next few years as well wonderful answer and there been some I and just, just I want to go to Nick but just tell me do you find that the older people that you say who remember the songs might bring their younger generations with so, they do they do they bring their they bring their children sometimes the grandchildren oh, and yeah. I do look at the demographic and I think I don't want these I don't want these people like Bette Midler even like a you know mm -hmm. to be forgotten by the yeah. new generation some of these performers what what they brought to the stage is just sometimes like unparalleled in, in this generation sometimes so um I would love to to think that these shows are going to carry on and have a renaissance and and have the same you know that people will remember this great his, history of of Jewish artists from you know the 20th century yeah. and add to it and add to it so same question to you Nick um getting quite near when we're going to throw it open to our wonderful audience but um your jewish identity and your professional work i think i do know about a particular production that's felt jewish to you and where your identity impacted on your work made you feel you were the one to um direct it but you may come up with another one so i want to see what you say obviously well i think it's such an interesting question because yeah i've i have i have repeatedly um returned to jewish subject matter Mm. Um, as a director and as a producer, um, which is of immediate interest because it feels like it speaks very directly. Um, and that's kind of, um, you know, I, I, you mentioned uh, Joshua Sobel's play Ghetto. Um, I was thrilled that when I laid siege to Mike Lee <laughs> years ago, 2002, mm. he said the play he most wanted to do was the Jewish play that he'd never done, the, mm. the, the, that over all his decades, yes. he'd never created Jewish subject matter. Um, the, the, um, 
the the uh, uh, play you mentioned, Traveling Light. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and um, there was a, I'm just off the top of my head, um, there's a wonderful play by Ryan Craig. Uh, yes. at uh, at the national that um uh, the 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 um the, the, oh god yes. the holy rosenbergs was it called oh um, yes yeah uh, or i've always been attracted to that kind of tip but i think it's a much more interesting and wider ranging question than that because because obviously you know you, i look at the stuff i've done and most of it has not been specifically jewish but yeah. how jewish has it been and i would kind of leapfrog from that rather presumptuously to how Jewish is West Side Story. And that's in my mind because mm -hmm. I, found the, I found the movie completely overwhelming. I think the movie is absolutely wonderful. That mm -hmm. is, that is a, a, a musical written entirely by Jews, um, written and conceived by Jews. Um, it's also, by the way, written and conceived by gay men. They're all Jews. Yeah. There are Arthur Lawrence, Jerome Robbins, Stephen Sondheim, Leonard Bernstein, Bernstein, although married, gay. Um, all New Yorkers, all male, all white, all Jewish. How Jewish is West Side Story? The movie um, is not gay, but it's another Jew, and, and he's Californian, not New Yorker, Sp Spielberg. Um, the only non-Jewish involvement in West Side Story is Shakespeare. Um, uh, so, but there is, I think, something Jewish about it, which is that, um, somehow we are drawn to stories about, um, about those on the margins, mm. those, those who are struggling for acceptance. Um, I'm very, I'm a great supporter of World Jewish Relief. I so love it about World Jewish Relief that half the emails I get from them are not about Jewish causes at all. They're about Syria or Afghanistan mm. or, yes, or, or refugees to this country. Mm. That's what I think is Jewish. Yeah. And so I think, although I've never, it, it would be a very interesting thing to sit down and think about analytically. Is there something in my relationship to the great English canon that is Jewish almost undoubtedly there is i don't quite know what it is um but i think um i think the jewish experience of being both inside and outside is very very useful for uh performing creative and interpretative artists and the proof of that pudding is in the vast numbers of superb jewish filmmakers, Jewish composers, Jewish producers, Jewish directors, that, that there's obviously something about us that that um, that suits the business of telling stories, even making people laugh. Why do you make people laugh? Most comedians, most people who want to make other people laugh, do it because in some way, I don't want to get, um, I, I don't want to get too deep here, but do it in some way because they crave acceptance. They crave the warmth of uh, being able to make self-satisfied people laugh themselves out of their self-satisfaction. That's, the, it's so, that, the, there, there are legions of fabulous Jewish comics who don't just make other Jews laugh, they make everybody laugh. Yeah, um, so true. I think it's a very, very, it's a really good question, and um, and one that um, one that has an a, an answer that just um, that that just uh, repays an awful lot of thinking about. I so I'll answer the question with that other question: How Jewish is West Side Story? That Jews always do that. That proves it's Jewish. Just now, but we really have to get to our audience. But nonetheless, we have to look to the future. So I'm saying in the light of everything that's happened in the pandemic, how do you see theatre in general, as well as your specific work, changing in the next few years? But what role does theatre have to play in economic and social recovery from the pandemic? Can we see beyond the pandemic? Are you looking beyond the pandemic? We always have to look ahead because <laughs> we're yeah. always planning ahead because it takes so much time to create live theatre. Um, I think there's big changes we've already seen, you know, um, I was part of that festival Nika Burns did in the West End where she allowed her theatres on a slightly lower 
you know, deal with the box office, which allowed some new writing to happen. Um, we were able to do a couple of shows, but I think that, I think the, the economic scale of, I, I'm talking about musicals again, of, of creating these big, huge budget shows that run and run and run. I think that's going to change. I think that trends and how and what people connect with and how quickly people move on is going to change. I think there's going to be a much larger variety of story that we're going to want to hear and we're going to want to, you know, connect with and stories we need to hear being told. And I think that everything's changing. The idea of engagement, social media, TikTok, Instagram, the idea of how we focus and how we share and how we connect with others internationally, how we make work with international artists. I think the pandemic is going to make a big difference, actually. And I think that hopefully there will be new voices collaborating with experienced voices as well, because we need we need the collaboration. We all need to learn. We all need to share. Um, but I think it's more about how audiences are going to engage with the idea of live theatre and what they're going to want want to do, because the idea of home entertainment and being entertained at home has has developed so much. And there's so much brilliant content accessible at any point for such a small amount of money that doesn't mean theatre is over at all but it just means that theatre is going to be seen as something different I think you've taken to the streets haven't you with your, your contact project. oh yeah we've, we did stuff outdoors we just needed to keep busy you know so but um I think I think technology and innovation is a big thing both with how we promote musicals and how we engage people but I just think the idea of, 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 of the ecology of even the regional landscape of how you put a show on sale, went into a brochure, had a certain amount of sales and did that again. I think, I think that's going to change. I really do. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick, how are you looking at the future near and far? Yeah, I think Katie's right. I, nothing about the pandemic is good. Um, nothing has been good. No good will come of it. Um, it's been, it, it's been, it's been a terrible rupture um, in in kind of every area of our lives, really. Um, but I think I think it's hastened um, certain trends that were already evident and focused others. Um, I completely agree that the way we communicate, the way we promote, um, the way we reach audiences um, is changing. Uh, but what I don't think is that the future of the theatre is digital any more than I think that the future of live dance, live music mm. is digital. I've, I've always felt this is not a new thought, that one of the consequences of the digital revolu revolution is that it puts into high relief the value um, those who love to share the live experience with other people puts into high relief the, the value they put on it. Um, the more that's available at the click of a mouse, uh, the higher the value uh, people will give to being there in the same room mm. at the same time. Uh, a, a digital version of that is a terrific way of communicating it to people who can't be in the same room at the same time. That's, you know, uh, back in was it 2000, 2009, 10, uh, at the National, we started NT Live, doing it to mm, cinemas. Yes, of course. With a certain amount of trepidation. And that was the fabulous thing about it. Not that it was as good, or even that it took it to new audiences. It just took it to people who literally, physically, geographically, mm -hmm. couldn't be in the same room at the same time. That's a phenomenal thing. But once, once theatre is digital, it's not theatre anymore. Theatre is the thing that happens live um, one time only, even if it then happens in Different every the night. same way 200 more times, it's live on the night. So I think that's, I don't think that's going anywhere. The, that's been written off over and over and over again uh, over the centuries, but the particular thrill of being there and seeing, um, you know, seeing Tony Sher play King Lear it, 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 with, with only 900 or 1200 other people. That's, that seeing, um, you know, seeing um, uh, Nureyev dance, 
just going, the thing, what experiences do I wish I've had? Um, I wish I'd been around to see certain people live who I didn't see live. Mm. God, I would have loved to have seen Nina Simone, you know. Mm. Uh, I can listen to her any damn time I like. I can, sum her up, I can sum her up on YouTube any damn time I like. Everybody must understand that, but it doesn't matter how vivid an artist is on screen, you still, if, you still wanna be there in the room. And that's, so I think that'll, that, won't, um, that won't go anywhere. Well, we, I hope, are now going to myriad questions. I'm sure people are queuing up to ask you questions. I've heard quite enough from me, but thank you so, so much for your wonderful answers. And I think, who is going to take over from me now? I think Aviva, is it? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Judy, for bringing Nick and Katie's backgrounds and interests to us. Um, we have had questions absolutely pouring in. Um, what's really interesting is in the audience, we have a huge range of the Jewish community, but we've also got a huge range of people who are involved in theatre, from young theatre makers in their 20s, all wow. the way to Thelma Ruby, who's 96, yeah, and an actress, wonderful. which is wonderful. We've also had questions coming in from reviewers, critics, writers, and about five people have come in with exactly the same question. So I'm sure it's not going to surprise anybody, but it's I think we've got to cover it. So I'm going to invite Georgia Snow from the stage to come up and ask you about some of the recent issues. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Katie. Hi, Nick. Um, that was super interesting. Thank you. Um, I just wondered what your take is on the current debate around casting non-Jewish actors in uh, explicitly Jewish roles. Um, sparked by Maureen Lippmann's recent criticism of Helen Mirren, who is playing a Jewish film role. And how do you think that debate plays out in theatre? Is it the same in film or is it, do you think about it differently? Thank you. Nick? <laughs> I, 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 find it, I find it impossible to be dogmatic on this, but I, absolutely impossible. I think, um, I think, I think, Dogma um, is never going to get you anywhere in um, in in theatre, literature, art. Uh, I see everybody's point of view. Uh, uh, I've listen. Um, I, I I look at the Jewish subject matter I've dealt with. There's always been Jewish artists involved, but there've also always been non-Jewish artists involved. Um, and uh, I suppose, uh, in principle, uh, I, I believe that anybody should be allowed to approach and get themselves involved in any kind of material, but I cannot be dogmatic about that. I cannot turn that into a rule um, because, uh, because, there are always um, there are always ways of looking at it from another direction. Um, so I I think that that it also depends on what your objective is and the purpose of the piece that you're doing. If um, it depends how far you are from the from the, you know, the, um, the naked authenticity of a Jew standing up and telling you what it feels like to be Jewish, to that experience transmuted into something like at the other extreme West Side Story, which started off, as we all know, about Jews and Catholics uh, in the Lower East Side and ended up um, being Poles and Puerto Ricans in the Upper West Side. But, uh, the Jewish experience was transmuted, transformed. Um, I, I think, I think honestly, one of the problems is you got two hundred words. You're looking, you're you're obviously looking for people to take dogmatic positions because that's interesting and it's great to be able to argue. But 
I can't. I'm sorry, I can't. I've, I, <laughs> I, I'm sure Helen, I'm sure Helen Mirren is phenomenal casting for Golda Meir. Um, and at the same time, I'm sure that, um, that a Jewish actress would also have been very good. <laughs> Um, so I'm there's I, I I don't I don't find it easy. Uh, I've seen over the last twenty years. I have on several occasions in the opera house seen white men sing Otello. It's not a problem. They don't black up because that is plainly offensive. As offensive as it would be if a Jewish if a non-Jewish actor put on a sucking great hook nose and pay us to, um, to play Fagin. Um, obviously, that's offensive. But uh, Verdi's Otello, so many things you have to be to play Verdi's Otello, including a heroic tenor with a voice big enough to hit the back wall of Covent Garden, that it is, it isn't a problem. Um, for a white man to sing a text, which in the case of the Boita text, barely refers to um, the character's blackness, only once or twice. Um, but do I think that, uh, um, do I think that uh, a white actor should put on makeup and play Othello? No, I think that would be offensive for all sorts of different reasons, but, should a white actor never play Othello? Well, that's also been done because there have been very well received productions of Othello which have been racially non-specific or, or in photographic negative. Everybody, everybody black except uh, except uh, Othello in a black. Uh, and you know, the, it's there are no rules. Is is what I'm saying. I'm finding it very very hard to give you your two hundred words, uh, Georgia. So um, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I think I, I think it's um. Art isn't easy, and and uh, uh, dogma is the enemy of art. I think that was a brilliant. I I, I think that was articulated brilliantly. I mean, I, I agree. I think it depends on the piece, and I think it depends. I, I do believe that a representation, authenticity, when a piece requires it, is hugely important. Um, and as Nicholas said, that doesn't mean that. In every in every production of Fiddler on the Roof, every single person should be Jewish, um, and they never and they never are. Um, but there has to be a meaningful understanding. I mean, that specific show is about tradition, which is why that show works all around in the world, everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's 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 obviously summarised, and as Nick said, when when things are discussed and put to a few points, you can't you can't cover enough of, of it, but I think the fundamental part is, is um, authenticity and, 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 sh and, and understanding what the text is requiring and what the subject's requiring. Thank you. Um, we've got um, Emma Brand who actually works for Lions Learning, but in her other life, she is a theatre maker. Um, in her 20s and she is one of the people who's been working with the Royal Court from a Jewish perspective since their controversy and I think she'd like to come on and kind of widen the question out beyond casting and kind of talk about Jewishness in the theatre and she also has another question for us as well so Emma over to you. Just following on from that question, because, yeah, for, for me, I, I, I feel like this discussion should be bigger than casting. Um, it's about being a, a Jewish theatre maker, a Jewish person who works within the theatre industry and what that means and what it feels like to be in that kind of minority group and to have a stake in how Jewish stories are told. Um, so I guess my question is, would you encourage um, Jewish makers, particularly emerging Jewish makers to lean into their Jewishness, be open about their Jewishness, be kind of out in the industry? Um, or have you found it better to kind of steer clear of identity issues and politics in, in making work? 
I don't know if I feel like I'm in a privileged position, but I've I've always just celebrated who I am and celebrated my Jewishness and been proud of it and um, nev- never really over thought about it too too much. I just <laughs> literally go with my my gut and, and move forward with the work that I love. And then as I've grown up, felt very proud to be part of the Jewish um, group of creatives that are doing work in London and beyond. Um, so I, I would say I would encourage everybody to embrace that part of them if it's something that's important to them. I wouldn't force something upon you because you think that it, it can make you different. I think you should listen to yourself and, and think what's important to me and what work do I want to make every day, whether you're a producer, a producing artistic director, a director, you ask yourself, what is the sort of work that I want to do? Um, and that speaks to you really honestly, and you can't force that. And that those tastes and what you gravitate towards will change as you grow up and have different experiences. So for me, it naturally, Jewishness was a part of my upbringing, was a part of my life, and it was a huge influence in some of the choices I've made and my introduction to music through being in a very musical Jewish school I was talking to everyone about before the chat started how much King David really had such a great sort of music department and drama and it was a big part of my life as a you know six-year-old seven-year-old it was a huge thing so yes celebrate it if 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 indeed you feel that you want to um it's it's brilliant to accept your identity and 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 celebrate it and find other creatives and find work that you really connect with so that you can make groundbreaking and life-changing work I think that's ultimately what what the goal is Nick yeah I completely I completely agree I think Katie is absolutely right you you go down the road that feels right to you um speaking for myself I feel that um I, I couldn't describe myself as just Jewish. That, uh, it, that uh, um, uh, I think, and maybe I, uh, maybe um, I'm showing my age, but I think that everybody's identity is kaleidoscopic. Uh, there may be um, bipolar Jews, gay Jews, me. Um, uh, it, there may there may be Glaswegian Jews for whom Glasgow is, at the particular moment they sit down to write, more vivid to them uh, in that moment um, than being Jewish. Uh, Maybe they wish to imagine themselves, I still think that people should be allowed to imagine themselves to be something else when they're artists. Um, I think that is part of the um, wellspring of creativity. So I think I I do, uh, so I'm fascinated by, the emergence recently of a much stronger Jewish voice in the theatre. I find that really fascinating and uh, uh, and really inspiring. But I'd say lean into whatever feels vivid, whatever feels urgent to you um, at the time that you're creating. And there are some creative people who tell some variation of the same story every time. Um, and some of the very greatest artists have done that. Um, uh, and, and some artists range very widely. Uh, it's not that one is better than the other. It's just that, um, it's just that uh, the things which get people moving differ from person to person. So, um, uh, um, and I think the Jewish experience itself is so various. Um, it, uh, we all know that um, it's been it's been amazing over the last 10, 20 years to see more of the ultra orthodox experience, which is that that's totally strange to me. I have you know that's that might as well to me um, be the Siberian experience for the amount of personal connection I have to it, except, um, except of course, you know, that there, no, there's a great, there's a much greater personal connection than there is to the Siberian experience because you think, oh my God, that is me too. But, um, but 
the, uh, the life of, I sorry to keep coming back to West Side Story. I loved it. Um, but <laughs> the, the life of Stephen Sondheim and the life of, you know, Sam Lubavitcher in Brooklyn could not be more different, even though they are, they lived, um, you know, two miles from each other. Um, they're, they're both Jewish, but they're really, really different. Um, so I think what you, you lean into whatever you know. Fantastic, thank you. I'm gonna stick with politics, but take away identity politics. I think we've done enough identity politics for this evening, but we've had a really interesting question about politics come in on the chat from someone who is a little bit shy and wants to stay anonymous. So I'll ask on their behalf, which is that they've noticed a lot of creatives are on the side involved in charity work, involved in campaigning work. To what extent do you think that this is something intrinsic to what art does? And what should the relationship between theatre and politics be versus theatre as entertainment? And a little bit also kind of impacting that. And is that impacted by things like the Charity Commission and state funding, um, as opposed to kind of fully free independent theatres? So maybe I'll start with Nicholas on that one first. Um. Again, I, I, it's something where, that at the National, um, I, never, I never had any problem with programming regularly things which exist to entertain, mm. because I think that, I think that seeing, some, seeing brilliant comic actors uh, do something very funny very well is as legitimate as a uh, uh, pursuit of the National Theatre as um, as seeing great actors do Greek tragedy. Um, as far as as far as the political content, uh, yeah, I think I think um, a lot of theatre is by nature political. Um, it's but <laughs> my personal preference is for deeply political theatre that doesn't necessarily. Um, have a program or or um, preach a dogmatic message. You won't be surprised to hear that. That's my personal preference. Um, it's not to say that theatre shouldn't have a very clear moral compass, but it is the nature of the best theatre that it sees that it's it it has to see both sides, all sides. You put, you it, it, using theatre to preach a message. Um, is, is less involving and less productive than, than asking people to experience not just all sides of an argument, but um, all facets of, a, of the human experience. Um, so uh, um, so I, I, I think, um, I, I, I think it's again, it's, I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not giving a yes or no answer, but it's, um, that's uh, that. I think one of the reasons why why Shakespeare works so well is because there was so much he couldn't say overtly because he's uh, living in a in a, a totalitarian state with a, um, in a it's a it's a monarchy uh, with a very very active secret police, uh, whether with a, and also active religious authorities. Where are things you can't where are things you can't say overtly? He finds ways of saying absolutely everything by telling stories that are apparently foreign, but of course pierce right through not just to the individual but to the society that he lived in. And um, uh, I think um, I, th I think that's. Um, that has served a lot of dramatists extremely well, that approach. Absolutely. Katie, do you want to add anything to you that? You had quite a few other parts of that question, didn't you, as well? Did you say about artists working in, you know, activists and chari being charitable outside of their... Yeah, so the question started by saying that lots of creative people are involved in charitable work and campaigning and kind of to what extent does that and should that influence the theatrical work? Yeah, and I, 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 as Nicholas said as well, you know, the, being an artist and, and how you connect 
with the world and what the words on the page are saying and how you how you see things it's it's a very well it's a wonderful position to be in as in how you feel and how you respond and how you evolve and how you connect and those that we know we spend most of our time with other artists and it's you know it's tough but it's it's, it's one of the most brilliant things in the world so I think those people are passionate they have uh, causes and they have connections with things and they want to make change and they want to influence but you know there's a way to do that and there's a way to do it in a more powerful way you know in terms of how how it is subliminally sort of dealt with in the subject matter so um again I think again it's 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 that leadership is at the top of the you know the programming the choices the commissioning and finding the voices um and what they want to say um but yeah Nick, Nick articulated most of that really first and well okay let's move on I know we want to have some questions about specific productions and performances and work in theatre and I believe Rachel Gaffin would like to ask a question can't hear you can you hear me now yes hello I feel very honoured to be in both of your um privilege to meet you both albeit um, virtually. So here's my question. Um, I wrote it down and I wrote it so well I'm just going to read it. I was a student at drama school when I was lucky enough to see Ghetto. It affected me enormously and I went on to write my own and perform my own one woman play on the Holocaust um, which I did for Holocaust education and at that time I was wondering was there any hesitation about bringing such a Jewish play about such difficult issues to a wider audience and then the second half of the question is, and do you think you do it any differently in the current climate, to which I'm referring again to the Royal Court at Arrow? Thank you. Um, I don't think there was any hesitation. I felt no hesitation. Um, uh, and, um, and the context was really interesting back in the late 80s. It was, uh, it was a project, it was a play that was particularly championed at the National by David Orkin, then the executive director at the National. It was David who sent it to me. Um, uh, and that had, th there, were, there were plenty of Jewish people, not just actors, but um, uh, in the creative team involved, but it was predominantly not Jewish, by the way. Um, what I didn't fully appreciate until I started to speak to Joshua Sobol was how it was written initially in response to domestic Israeli politics um, that, uh, that he felt he wanted to, this sounds so bizarre, nearly what, 89, 30, 30 plus years on. Uh, he wanted to address uh, the guilt, the um, unspoken guilt, as he saw it, of the survivor generation of Israelis. Uh, he wanted to tell the story about, uh, the, the, about how impossible and obscene the choices that those who survived were made to make. I think that bit of it might have um, flown over the heads of a lot of the non-Jewish audiences who responded, and I think I responded, to uh, the courage and creativity of the theatre troupe who still made art in the ghetto. But there was a lot more in it than that. And it would be very interesting now, uh, with that generation, um, 30 years ago, very much alive, now either very, very old or no longer with us. It'd be very interesting to see what that play felt like. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, it was, um, the, the, but to go back to your first question, no, there was no hesitation. And, um, and uh, what would I do differently? I think the music, the performance in it, 
was super glossy in the way it was produced. Glossy, wrong word. It was, it, we did more than justice uh, to the music and to the sketches. And I'm sure that, I'm absolutely certain that uh, the, um, the Yiddish theatre company in Vilnius was every bit as good as anything that we could have reproduced. But the circumstances in the ghetto uh, would not have permitted uh, the kind of production values that we gave to that music at the time. At the time, that music was overwhelmingly moving. I think if I did it now, I'd trust it to be just as moving if done with, um, a, with what you might call more of a poor theater aesthetic. It feels, it feels um, presumptuous even to be talking in these terms about what they wrote, what they did and what they performed under those circumstances. Um, but it, it, it has sometimes seemed to me since I did it that maybe, maybe some of it was just, was a little overdone. I've, I've been told about this, this show so many times um, through my career that I need to do it, a revival, funnily enough. Could be, could be time for a revival. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs>Sorry, sorry. We've had so many comments coming in just saying that. Just before you started speaking, Katie, David Neville sent in a chat message going, when's the revival going to go? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a job for you. That's, I mean, obviously that's the Holocaust and the ghetto is a very significant 20th century story for Jews. We've had a question coming over the chat from Barbara and Anthony Nichols asking about the kind of the current political situation of the 21st century that's key to Jews. So can I throw it over to Anthony? Oh, oh. Yeah. we're getting some rather odd sound there. Um, Anthony, do you want to just have one more go? I'm so sorry. Why not? Why not? Why not write the question? I, I, write I, he's written it to me already. I'm so sorry, Anthony. You sound like either you're a muppet or you've just ingested helium, which I know is neither of those are true. But in writing, what Anthony put is, should we be making theatre about the Israeli-Palestinian? situation and if so how do we go about it now so i don't know if either of you want to take that one on yeah we should we should and we should too because um it's really i mean it's so difficult isn't it it's um it's something else that it's it's that i find it very very hard to be dogmatic about but i think um i think and it <laughs> It's, it's certainly a subject which Israeli theatre makers preeminently mm -hmm. um, make fascinating, difficult, painful work about. Um, I'd say the best, um, the, the best work on that subject have, that I have seen has been made by either Israeli or Palestinian um, uh, theatre makers. And it's, uh, it, it, the, um, yeah, art should not shy away uh, from even the most painful and the most difficult situations. Um, and I think it, it, it's, um, it's really important for the anti-Semites uh, who use the occupation as cover for their anti-Semitism. It's really important that they are on occasion confronted with Jewish thinkers and Jewish artists um, who acknowledge the pain and the difficulty and the complication, because I feel if we can't acknowledge that this is a deeply painful situation, um, if we are forced into a corner by those anti-Semites where we are afraid of that acknowledgement, 
then we do their job for them. That is, that's my view as, a, as, as an individual, not, a, not particularly as a theatre maker. But I think, I think the theatre shouldn't shy away from, from painful situations. Um, I, I, but I also think that, um, that, uh, that to, I, I've changed my mind. I've not changed my mind. I have had my eyes opened um, even over the last few years to, um, to uh, 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 an anti-Semitism which I had thought was nothing like as present in our society as it obviously is. And I, I, I think that I think that we have to we have one of our jobs sh should be to separate anti-Semitism from an honest discussion of a very painful situation. Okay. So I'm going to take your answer to that question as permission giving. Um, we've had a lot more questions coming in. I mean, there's huge numbers of questions coming through and I think we're gonna have to have you both back sometime. But I really could only take two more because we've promised we'll finish no later than 9.30. Um, before I go on to our last question from Jonathan Lass, which is a bit more looking towards the future, I am going to take a kind of more difficult and painful question. So Emma Jude Harris would like to come back to us on the um, identity politics questions. Um, and I know she's also been very involved in some of the work that Jewish theatre makers have been doing around some of these difficult issues. So Emma, over to you. Hi, oh, thanks for that. Sorry, I was just gonna ask the question without highlighting it, highlighting it or prefacing it as being scary. It's hopefully not a scary one. Thank you all, it's so valuable to hear um, what you have to say on all of this. I guess my question, Nick, is in relation to um, using a tello as a reference point. Um, I'm just intrigued, first of all, opera is, is a different medium and it's one historically wherein casting and problematic casting has been justified based on voice type. Um, so I'm interested in this idea of like using uh, an example from opera to answer a question about theater and kind of potential differences between those forms wherein maybe um, there are problems within opera. I think there's a really big discourse there about yellow face and about blackface. And I guess that the follow-up question to that would be, uh, do you think it's ever appropriate for a white tenor to sing a tello um, regardless of makeup? Yeah, well, it, I do. I don't, I, I, think it's, I think it's totally inappropriate for uh, a white tenor or a white soprano to go into blackface or yellow face. Mm -hmm. But I think that, I think that, uh, I think that, again, I find it impossible to be dogmatic. Um, I've done Othello, Shakespeare, I've never done the opera. And I think I'd find it quite hard to do the opera personally um, without, um, I, I, for all sorts of reasons, uh, I've done opera on occasion. I've done Othello with um, Adrian Lester, and I think we both of us, I can't speak for him, but I, he has written about it. Um, we both of us, by the end of the process, uh, were of the opinion that it's that the color of Othello's skin is only a part of the identity that is being explored in that play. So this is a kind of roundabout answer to your question, um, but it is worth focusing on the specific because I don't want to be, I don't want to be, to back myself into a corner where I'm making rules or, or, um, or uh, appearing to create some kind of principle. But in the case of Othello, uh, the thing, the, uh, the, the reason why Othello becomes unpicked, the reasons why Othello falls in on himself include that he is a soldier who has no experience of civilian life, a soldier who has never been in a sustained relationship with a woman, a middle-aged man who idealizes women and never sees his wife, his new young wife, as 
anything much more than a glamorous trophy. Um, a rough, uncultivated man. These are all, I'm now telling you things which in Shakespeare's better language, he tells us about himself. A rough, uncultivated man among sophisticated Venetians and also black man amongst white people. Um, I think it's possible to approach that play and decide, um, you know, the, for, for this time, uh, it, it's, it might be quite interesting for Othello not to be black. Um, and I realize that I'm not comparing like with like, but one of the most exciting things I saw um, in the last few years was a production of Cyrano. It's coming back into the West End by Jamie Lloyd and I think it's touring as well. It, it might, I, I think it's touring um, with James McAvoy as Cyrano. James McAvoy, an extraordinarily good looking and charismatic man who did nothing, uh, nothing whatsoever uh, to respond to the constant demand in that text that Cyrano should be hideously ugly to look at with a big nose. No big nose, no ugly, just, the text, and it was dazzling. The audience was being asked to imagine uh, that the character Cyrano was what um, the actor was telling you he was, or maybe he wasn't. Maybe, this was what was so thrilling about the production, maybe Cyrano was as charismatic and as beautiful as James McAvoy, but just had that image of himself. Um, and, I, and I could imagine a production of Richard III, I think probably now we're at a place where I don't want to see particularly, again, I don't want to be dramatic, but I don't particularly want to see an able-bodied actor strap on a hump and pretend to be physically something that he isn't. But I'd be really interested to see an able-bodied actor just play it. Um, just play it and make the performance about what he felt about himself and how what he feels about himself drives him to do to others what he does to others. So I think there is an imaginative landscape that it is possible for all art to inhabit, uh, which makes it very hard to submit it to hard and fast principles. So um, I'm absolutely not saying, very, very much not saying that it doesn't matter if a part that is written as one thing is played as another thing, that a part that is that demands a degree of authenticity is played inauthentically. But what I am saying is that there are, that everything that is written to be performed um, can be imaginatively reconstructed, imaginatively remade, so that the audience is invited to come at it and look at it from another direction. So I think that where I'm uncomfortable is where art, which is porous, art, which is nuanced, art, which is ambiguous, art, which sets out to make no conclusions, is submitted to a set of principles, hard and fast principles, which says this is allowed and this isn't allowed. That's, that's, that is the best I can do. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, I think we should finish on a note about going forward. Um, Jonathan Lass has a question about not just kind of the people on stage, but the audiences. So I'm going to hand over to him. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Katie and Nick for such a wide ranging and and, and stimulating exchange of views from your perspectives uh, from as producer and as artistic directors. Um, as we uh, come out of the pandemic, please God, uh, I would welcome your thoughts as to the, uh, what you would do to expand the role of the, the vital role of the theatre and live performances to engage a wider and younger audience, both of course in London, 
but equally important uh, nationally and even internationally. Well, again, I think well, again, it comes down to the stories that we're... Oh, I think... Can you mute, Jonathan? Because my... Oh, there. Great. I think that um, it comes down to the stories that are relevant for now. And I think the stories that are relevant for now is when we as programmers, or as artists, as directors, producers, think about how we're going to connect with the widest audience. So it's about... This, it's about us being open to the scripts. You know, we have to find artists. You know, we can't just we can't just produce um, out of thin air. We have to find the stories that are being told. So we have to engage with writers, read materials, put people together, commission, and we need to we need to think about what people might want to watch. And and none of us have a crystal ball. We can only go with what we think is a story that needs to be told and, 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 a, and a subject matter that we think needs to be covered and telling stories that perhaps haven't been told before and elevating certain characters and stories that haven't been heard before. I, I'm very much drawn to always trying to do something for the first time or reimagined. Um, and some of the things I'm focusing on is how we tell new stories in theatre. And so I go out and try and find artists that have projects that I'll be able to do that with. Um, and then it also is about how we, what we spoke about earlier, the engagement with audiences, how we, with especially the younger audiences and how we um, connect with them through different social media platforms, um, how digital theater can maybe be a, a way to incentivize people to come to theater in the way the concept album was a thing that got people engaged maybe in the 80s oh okay I'm going to see Jesus Christ Superstar on stage it was a great record so I think that we've got to think of new ways to connect with people and we need to think of creative ways to keep the ticket prices um, accessible because it's so expensive creating a show you know it can take years and then you've got to cover its running costs so unfortunately for musicals it can take 10 years to finish a show and then you've got all those costs to try and get back as you're running it every week and not all musicals are do receive a lot less subsidy in this country than plays do. So we're constantly trying to find a way to platform them. So for me, that's why I've really tried to finesse an art for doing things on a smaller budget, but trying to, to pack a punch with the emotional discourse of it. And I think that my future will be to continue small new productions in in intimate spaces of 200 seats to see if those shows have legs and to try and get that evangelical response from an audience and find the backers and the partners to elevate it to a bigger commercial um, landscape. So, you know, we, we, con we continue to evolve our programming. All of us have to, we're all programmers, we're all deciding on what to put on and we have to engage with the world and the ever-changing um, dynamic of our world and continue to hopefully find great storytellers who are going to allow us to continue making great theater. I think that's a really lovely way for you to end, Katie. Thank you so much for that. Nick, one sentence, last word. Yeah, I think I think I agree with everything that. Find the stories, find the stories, find the material that connects. I wanna say just one thing. I, I cheated while um, Katie was speaking, very briefly cheated on the ticket price issue. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, half the tickets, or two, a third of the tickets, the national half, uh, a lot of the shows when I was there was 10 rising to 15 quid. It's really important they're cheap, but boy, oh boy, do we beat ourselves up. Um, do we give ourselves a bad press about this? Um, I've just quickly found a website I will put Googled ticket prices, Manchester United. Uh, Manchester City versus Manchester United, Etihad Stadium from 176 pounds. Manchester United versus Tottenham Hotspur, Old Trafford from 103 pounds. Manchester United versus Atletico Madrid, Old Trafford from 173 pounds. Uh, we don't do badly. We really don't do badly. When you think of the value for money that you get when you come see a musical with a big orchestra in the pit and a vast chorus of people, what they're supposed to live off baked beans so that every ticket should be 10 pounds. Football is infinitely more expensive 
than theater, infinitely more expensive. Um, and I know that, you know, I'm gonna now, um, would make my brothers proud of me, except they're not watching. I know that the Glazers are not popular at Manchester United for exactly this kind of um, gouging, but nevertheless, we, we spend so much time uh, trying to balance uh, how expensive it is to put on a show or a concert or a ballet with making sure that it's affordable, at least for a large part of the auditorium for people to come see it. I think we're a hundred times better than the marvelous world of football, which politicians are so keen on telling us they enjoy so much. Okay. Yeah. If Georgia from the stage is still listening, there's <laughs> 200 words. <laughs> well, there you go, George. If she's not, we'll send her the recording. <laughs> um, very, very interesting. Um, I just want to say, I'm going to jump off the back of that to make a plug for Jewish Renaissance because we do offer events like this constantly through the year. And while we've been doing them on Zoom, we've been offering them for free. What we do is we have an ethical ticket pricing structure where people can come for free or can choose to donate. Um, it's really interesting, the range of people who do donate and the amounts that they donate. So I just, I, 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 first of all, I'm going to encourage all of you, please do support our work to make these conversations possible. But also to say that I wonder if there are different models that the theatre should be looking at. I'm not saying ethical ticket pricing kind of will work throughout, but just are there ways to be able to enable the young and those who don't have money to attend, and yet those who can afford to charge them properly and make sure actors, producers, actually stage managers, lighting and tech people are all paid properly because that's ethical as well. So there we go. And I hope some of our audience will have a think about that as well in the work Jewish Renaissance does. On the, that note, I'm going to actually throw over to our chair, chairman of Jewish Renaissance, Ian Lancaster, to thank hugely Nick and Katie for being with us this evening. Thanks, Aviva. And indeed, thanks, everyone. Um, I want to start just by going back to what Sybil said at the beginning, um, that this is a joint event between Lions Learning and Jewish Renaissance. And what a, a privilege and honor, and how exciting it is for our two organizations to be working together in this way. And what a great evening of chat, discussion, information to, to mark this, the beginning of this new partnership relationship with us. Uh, I also have to remind everybody that we're doing this as part of the 20th anniversary of Jewish Renaissance. And that in turn um, has been marked with the publication of this book, Age of Confidence, uh, The New Jewish Culture Wave. And I strongly recommend it, obviously. It, it casts its eye over the last 20 years of Jewish culture in the UK and, and more widely. Uh, it has some articles from the history of JI of that period. Uh, it's also got a, a, a fascinating review of theatre over the last 20 years by Judy, Judy Herman, who didn't say a word about it, so I want to thank you, Judy, for a fascinating uh, overview. But the age of confidence, I mean, what could be more demonstrative of the confidence of Jewish culture, the confidence of Jews in theatre, than the two people we've had talking as this evening? Katie, started her ARIA Entertainments in 2012. Nicholas left the National and went off and started, built and opened and runs a new theatre, the Bridge Theatre, both doing fantastic work. Where do you get the confidence? Well, I think there has been an upsurge of recognition of Jewish identity, Jewish culture, Jewish Renaissance over the last 20 years. You two have given us fascinating insights into your own work, into the bigger world 
of theatre, of Jewish identity and theatre. And all I can do is thank you for a fascinating hour or so. Thank you to those who've asked questions. Thank you for your discussion, your answers. Thank you to Aviva for guiding us through the Q&A. And everyone have a lovely rest of the evening and a great 2022. I look forward to seeing a lot of new shows and some revivals. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Really great pleasure.